So you heard of Six Sigma and you're trying to sift through all of the jargon and the information because my goodness, there's a lot of it. Well, in this video, I'm going to share with you a simple breakdown of what Six Sigma is. What is Six Sigma? It's a disciplined, statistical-based, data-driven approach and continuous improvement methodology for eliminating defects in product, process, or service. It was developed by Motorola in the early 1980s. The approach, however, was based on methods taught by Dr. William Edward Deming and others and became popular management approach at GE in the early 1990s. It's built on quality management fundamentals and companies around the world have adopted Six Sigma as a way of doing business. Industries that use Six Sigma include automotive, electronics, healthcare, manufacturing, and transportation. Now, why is it called Six Sigma? It represents the measure of the variation in a data set collected with a margin of error that can be up to six standard deviations from the mean. Now, the mean is an average of a data set. So if I have 10 numbers, I will add up those 10 numbers and then divide it by the amount of numbers I added, which is 10, and that produces my average. And in math terms, Six Sigma is 99.9997%, which means a Six Sigma performance produces a defect-free product 99.9997% of the time. The goal of Six Sigma is to achieve a level of quality that is nearly perfect. And for organizations that use this method, Every sigma improvement from a two sigma to a three sigma, et cetera, will reduce cost and increase customer satisfaction. So let's look at this visually and let's look at this from a product perspective. The yellow here that you see in this graph is basically product data points. So this represents the yellow, everything coming off a manufacturing line based on the data that was collected. Now, how good your manufacturing process is going to determine how wide or how tight your graph is. Now, the next thing to look at are the lower and upper specification limits. Specification limits are values between which products should operate. So limits are usually set by customer requirements. So for example, think about a cap for a jar. The cap must fit the jar within a specific limit. If it's too small, it won't fit on the jar, and if it's too big, it won't keep it sealed. So that's why you have these limits, to say whatever I'm producing has to fit within the lower and the upper. On the bottom of the graph represents standard deviation. Standard deviation is a measure of the amount of variation of a set of data points spread around the mean. And we'll get into this and the percentages in the next slide. So if I were analyzing this graph based on the lower and upper spec limits, this product quality is great. It is spread around the mean, well within the lower and upper specification limits. This is a really good process. Now, let's say we have a product that has specific lower and upper specification limits. Now we can see by the data points within this graph, based on these limits, this is really important, based on these limits, there's a lot of spread and variation in this process. And if we go past the lower limit and past the upper limit, which means we have a lot of product that is falling in what we consider the defect area. So this process needs a lot of help and as a result is considered a one sigma process as only 68% of what is being produced is within specification and all the rest is defects, stuff that you just can't sell because it's past customer uh, requirements, their specifications. So for this particular process, there's a lot of wasted materials and write-offs, which is basically gonna impact the product profit, which can impact the customer order timing as you need to make more. It could also impact customer price because you may need to cover your costs because your process tons of variation, which could mean that if you increase that price for your customer, that you may be less competitive. So you can see by having a really terrible process, it can have huge implications to your business. Now, we can repeat this again. We have a product that has a lower limit 
and we have a product that has an upper specification limit. We can see by the data points that we have less variation than we did in the past. And you can see from a standpoint of our lower and upper, we have less waste than we did before with our one sigma process. So what this means is that we have a two sigma process as 95% of what we're producing is deemed acceptable, it's within the limits, and we only have a smaller amount that is deemed defects. So this is considered a two sigma process. This process is definitely better than the one sigma process. However, there's still waste that needs to be addressed. And for me, we still need to fix this process even though 95% of it is good. Why? Because we have too much of a spread from our mean. And if something were to go wrong, we could easily fall back into a one sigma process. Okay, there was a lot to unpack in what I just showed you on my computer. Now, just note, there's a lot more to it. This is a very high level overview, so you get a really good, clear understanding and fundamentals as to what it is. But now I wanna show you, there's actually a methodology to executing on that. So let's now move on to that. Why use Six Sigma? Well, what we just walked through, don't forget that a lot of companies who use this as a management principle use it to reduce costs and increase customer satisfaction. And from a business perspective, using Six Sigma is really important for operational growth and will give you a competitive advantage, which in some scenarios is going to be a game changer for an organization. Now, as a customer, should you be concerned about Six Sigma? My answer to you is yes, you should be. Now, why would I say that? Because think of it in this way. Remember what I showed you in regards to those uh, defects, right? The one sigma where we had a lot of defects on the right. As a customer, do you want to pay for all those defects and all the extra rework that went on? Because I promise you that cost is being put through to you. And that's why for some organizations, it becomes expensive to produce your product because they have to do a lot of rework. But not only that, let's take it in the context of products and services that are about life-saving ones or that are really critical to us as individuals. Think about your brakes for your car. Do you want a manufacturer of brakes to have a Six Sigma principle where they're always looking to reduce their defects and almost have a defect-free product? The answer is, yeah, of course you do. Do you want to have a brake company who makes those brakes for your car? Do you want them to have a One Sigma process where they may accidentally send you defect brakes? That stuff happens and we hear horror stories on it. So from a standpoint of business, Six Sigma is all about quality, customer service, ensuring that you have the best product and it's being put out consistently, reliably, and more important, repeatedly. So yes, that is reason why Six Sigma is really important and why you should have it, not just for a company, but why as, as a customer, as an end user who's receiving it, you should expect it. Now, before we get to the next tip, there's other failures that we have to think about defects, and I have this in here for you, so stay tuned, because later in the video, I'm gonna tell you how you can get your hands on it. How to deploy Six Sigma. Okay, I may have gotten you like, yes, I need to do Six Sigma. How do I do it, Adriana? Well, I'm gonna tell you how to do it right now. You, it's a very systematic process, and that process is an acronym, and it's called DMAIC, and it's very specific, so each, each letter has a stage associated with it. It's, it's very much aligned to like project stages. So your first one is D and D is define. Your second one is M, which is measure. Your third one is A, which is analyze. The fourth is I, which is improve. And the last for DMAIC, which is a C, is control. So you just follow that process of DMAIC and each one has something very specific, which I'm about to get into next. Now, before we get into in more detail DMAIC and what each one does and some information around that, there's two really critical things I want you to take note of. One is time. Doing Six Sigma projects are not fast. 
all right? You need to have time in order to do it. Some uh, Six Sigma projects can be a year, even two years, because all the work that you have to do. But even more importantly, it's the precision that you have to do it with. It is literally looking at things and vetting it out in such a precise way and getting data, validating that data, testing new concepts that you cannot be rushed. So if you have executives telling you, hey, push this through, you should get that done in two months, I'm gonna challenge you and say no, because when you're looking to jump your sigma levels, remember just from going from one sigma to two sigma, that's a huge leap. You need to be precise, you need to be systematic, and you need to give it time if you're going to ensure that what you're implementing and what you're changing is controlled and can be repeatable, is reliable, and as I said, repeatable and reliable. And you can produce that over and over and over. It's really, really critical. You cannot rush this process. You need to give it the due diligence of the precision and the time for it to be successful. Okay, now let's get back to the flow as to how do you deploy Six Sigma using Demaic. So let's start with the D. D is define, and that's really what it is. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? So you're trying to, no, you're trying because you're doing it. You really want to be clear on what it is that everyone is agreeing to do. So this is very much similar and a parallel to project management where we call initiation stage. You want to really get your scope lock down and everyone in agreement so that you can now move forward and which is to the next stage measure this is when you want to start collecting your data and you want to be able to measure what it is that you agree to do and define you can see a very systematic process step here so when you're measuring you need to have the most latest data now this becomes a challenge and this is why six sigma projects take longer because you should collect new data. You should collect the most recent data that you have, ideally at least the last three months. Now I say this because I've done lots of Demaic type Six Sigma projects with that flow and a lot of challenges Companies don't want to spend that upfront three month of data collection in order to get the right information. In fact, they'll say, hey, we got lots of data, but here's what you need to recognize and realize. A lot of companies collect data, but the data is old. So here you are going to be making these precision decisions and suggestions to what is that you have to do in order to really shift from a one sigma to a two sigma, even from a two sigma to a three and so on. It gets harder as you get closer to six sigma. So you need really good data. Data is at the heart of your sigma project because you need to have an understanding what you're working with and that's gonna give you direction as to what you're going to do. So if you have bad data that's old, that's going to give you nothing because it's nothing. It's old. How can you make a really good solid decision based on it? So it's just like in projects, you want the latest information and like in projects, think of this as your initiation and your initial planning stage, because with the measurement of all the data, you're now going to have to figure out what is your solution to what's going on, which actually takes us to the next stage. Analyze. Analyze. So this is where you take all the data that you were in measuring stage and now you start to analyze it. This is where the statistical analysis comes in because again you're talking about data points. You have a slew of data points that you have to take a look at and use statistical methods to do it. Now what are some of the tools in our toolbox when it comes to Six Sigma? I'm going to read this because there's so many and I'm not even going to touch upon them but some of them are control charts, run charts, response plan, XY matrix, fishbone diagram, value stream mapping, process mapping, hypothesis, testing, DOE, which is design of experiments, regression analysis, multivariance charts, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like there is so much. You can see the precision. We're getting down to details. We're getting down to the nitty gritty to truly understand why is this defect occurring? So that becomes really important. I would say one of the uh, two critical tools that you're going to take away with is value stream mapping, which by the way, I have a video on value stream mapping. If you go to the YouTube search bar, Adriana Girdler, value stream mapping, it will pop up and that will teach you how to value stream map. But the other one is, is control charts. That's a really another great tool that is used heavily when it comes to analyzing your data. So this analysis is really important because why? Once you're done the analysis, it's going to give you the information 
question as to why things are occurring the way they are, why your defects are occurring. And now, like in planning stage of a project, you have to put your plan together as to how you're going to address it. How are you going to correct these defects so that they don't happen? Before we break down I for improve, not only do you get this great free content here on YouTube, I wanna let you know that I just launched a brand new program called Slay Project Management Pro. Now what you get in it is you get my course material, which is lessons and templates, but not only that, you get access to me in weekly group coaching calls, plus a project AI tool, which is gonna help you fill out your templates and just make you even that much more successful. If you find this interesting and you wanna check it out, I have a link for you below under this video. Improve. This is when you start to implement your plan that you created when you did your analysis to say, okay, what is it that we have to do to address our issues? And you put a very solid plan together. You put some ideas together. So now you have to implement all of that. So part of that may be taking your concept and idea, putting it out there, then you're gonna probably wanna gather a little more data, test it out, did it come to fruition as to what you're expecting it to do? If it didn't, you may have to do some more tweaks and we call those iterations. So inside your improved stage, you may have a few iterations until you get things to where you want it to be based on the plan that you created. Again, everything's a building block and it's all together. So this is when you're actually doing the shift of the idea or concept that you need to do to make sure that you have less defects. Control. Okay, so you now are at the end. You have implemented everything that you wanted to do based on the data that you collected and you analyzed and now you put the plan together and it's all working the way you want it to work. The last stage is how are you going to ensure that it's controlled and stays that way? We talk about that it being reliable and repeatable. We call it R&R, &R, reliability and repeatability. How do we ensure that that does not change, shift, spread out? Remember what I said when I hopped on my computer, when you have that distribution of your data, if it's really wide, that means you don't have a controlled process. So we want to keep it as tight as possible. And this is where control comes into play. One of the techniques you may want to consider or something that we call out there is mistake proofing. So how can you mistake proof your ideas and ways of working to keep your defects to a bare minimum? So that's something to consider from a control perspective, but this is really critical. You can't just stop with implementing idea. You have to control it so that you can ensure that it's repeatable and that it's reliable. So that's a very high level explanation of Six Sigma. Now let me just reiterate, there is so much to Six Sigma. I just touched the surface for you so you have a general understanding because it can be a very overwhelming topic. It can be a very uh, difficult topic to kind of get your head wrapped around because of all the stats and the tools and the techniques. But the essence of it is really simplified and pure in a pure form that I hope I was able to deliver to you so that you have an understanding of it, at least a much better understanding of, of what it is. And as well, what I hope you also got is how parallel it is to projects. Because again, it's a methodology for improvement and the best, and how do you actually execute on a method that you want to improve? Well, you do it through project framework. So that's something I hope that you took away too, is how parallel they all together. It's a project, right? We do more projects than we know. And the Six Sigma is definitely a project that you should have not only the Demaic process around it, but you should also have some project framework around it as well. Okay, you know what? We're now here where I'm gonna be sharing with you, this is really important, understanding mistakes in projects, whether they're Six Sigma or regular projects, doesn't really matter, project's a project. And I created this just for you based on my experiences. So if you want this, you can get it underneath this video, there's a link, so go grab it. Make sure you watch this next video. It's your step-by-step -step guide on how to value stream map. Now on that note, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to this amazing community. And until the next time, I'll see you later.